For many of you scientists and engineers, you may not have been exposed to variational methods in your previous courses. So what I want to do in the next three videos is go through three examples. Two of them are physically motivated, and one is an optimization problem. And what I want to show you is that if you take the problem in its most basic form, uh, from a first principles perspective, as we discussed in the previous video, and turn that into the most natural mathematical expression of that physical principle or optimization principle, it ends up being a variational method, a calculus of variations problem. So I want to show you that first using optics. It'll clearly distinguish between when we would use differential calculus versus variational calculus to solve the optics problem. So the first problem will be optics. Then we'll look at the shape of a liquid drop and then the optimization of a river crossing trajectory in the next two videos. So optics, again, is a very useful example to look at first. We'll clearly be able to differentiate between when we would use differential calculus versus variational calculus in the same context, in the same physical phenomenon. So you'll remember that we use differential calculus when we're trying to find extrema, so minimums or maximums, of functions. So you take the derivative, set the derivative equal to zero, and you determine the value of the independent variable, usually x, for the location where those occur. So those identify the locations of our extremums of a function. So we use differential calculus to do that. In variational calculus, we're going to utilize a very analogous technique but to find extrema of what are called functionals. Now a functional is a definite integral involving some unknown function and typically its derivatives. So we have a definite integral which would normally just produce a number. You put in a function you do the definite integral and you get out a number. But in this case, we don't know what the function is inside the integral. So it's a definite integral involving an unknown function that we, were, that we are looking to determine. And so that's a functional. So we want to find extremas of functionals. We want to find the function that gives us the largest value or the function that gives us the smallest value of that definite integral. So we're looking for extrema of functionals. So you can see the parallels here, extrema of functions and extrema of functionals. Okay, so let's look at optics. Optics, again, is a great example. The principle is very simple. It's Fermat's principle. It says that the path of light between any two points is the one that requires the minimum travel time. So one thing you'll notice is the principle stated in words, and this is very often the case for the most fundamental principles of physics. So the first law of thermodynamics, conservation of energy. There is a mathematical form, but the way we often state it is in its, in its most basic form is in terms of words. Fermat's principle is the same way. So we want to take those words and express them in the most natural way mathematically that we can. And what happens here is that doing so results in a differential calculus problem if the media through which the light is traveling are homogeneous, so they don't change over space. However, if the media is non-homogeneous, so it does change over x, y, and z, then we have to use a variational calculus approach. So again, the same physics in one case leads to a differential problem, in one case leads to a variational calculus problem. All right, so let's take the most natural mathematical expression of the physical principle here stated in words for Ma's principle. So we want to determine the travel time. So we'll denote that by a capital T, and it depends on the path of the light, which we'll define as u of x. So u is our dependent variable. It represents the path of the light. x is our independent variable, and that represents the location. So you have two points, x0 and x1, and u0 and u1, and you want to determine the path of the light between them, u of x, the function that minimizes the travel time, capital T. So let's just determine how we do express capital T, the travel time, in a mathematical form. So to do this in the most straightforward way, you think, okay, so capital T, that's just the integral of dt from t0 to t1. And t0 is the time at which the light is at x0, and t1 is the time at which the light is at x1. So if you integrate dt, so take all the little differential segments of the path, and the amount of time it takes to traverse each of those little infinitesimal pieces, you add them up through integration, and you get the total travel time. Now time is distance divided by velocity. So instead of the integral from, of dt from t0 to t1, we could express this as the integral of ds. We start at x0, u0, we go to x1, u1, and we go along the path u of x, with ds being the little differential pieces along that path u of x. 
So if we integrate along those segments, the distance for each segment divided by the velocity at that location of the segment, then that would be equivalent to the time. Likewise, V can be expressed as N of XU. N of XU is the index of refraction of the medium. Now we're saying here that it could be a two-dimensional function. It depends on X and U. So based on the location in the medium, you have a different index of refraction. And divided by C, C is the constant speed of light in a vacuum. That's a universal constant. And then again, integrating with respect to S. So you can see what we did. We took the word statement of Fermat's principle and we, in the most natural way we could, expressed it in mathematical form. And we end up getting this equation right here. So the total travel time, that's our functional, is a definite integral from x0 to x1 integrated along the path of the light, the u of x. And it involves the index of refraction, which itself involves the independent variable x as well as the dependent variable u divided by the constant c. So let's first take a look at this in the context where we have two homogeneous media. So say we have air and then a water surface and then water below. So here's the surface between the water and the air, air up here, say, and water down here, for example. So each of those have different but constant indices of refraction. So it's homogeneous above and homogeneous below that water-air interface. So if it's homogeneous, the minimization of travel time turns out to be the same as minimizing the distance, which is a straight line. So you have a straight line in the water and a straight line in the air from x0, u0 to x1, u1, x being the location, the value of the independent variable where this path of the light, u of x, intersects with that interface. So try not to get too bogged down with the details of, of these three motivational examples. I just want to show you what we end up with in terms of what we need to solve in order to address these physical and optimization problems. Okay, so what we're basically looking for is this point right here. If I know this point, then I know the straight line path from x0, u0 to that point, and from that point to x1, u1. So we take equation 1.1, which is the equation for the travel time. We can take the 1 over c out front because that's a constant. And then we have the integral of n ds, but for the portion of the path in the air above that interface, n is n1, and that's a constant. We can take it outside the integral. So that integral goes from x0 to x along ds, along the path u of x. And then the index of refraction of the water, the, the liquid below the surface, is different, but it's also constant, n2. So we can take that out of the integral. We integrate, integrate from x to x1. So we've split up the two straight lines into these two integrals with different indices of refraction for the medium in each case. Well, this integral right here, that's just the length of that straight path, L1, and this integral is the length of the second path, L2. Those lengths are just the square root of the sum of the squares of the coordinates. So it's the square root of the square of x minus x0 plus u0 squared, and then for the lower line, it's the square root of the sum of the squares again, of the differences in the x's and the u's. What I want you to see, however, is now this expression for the travel time of the light is actually an algebraic function. We've evaluated the integral, so there's no integral anymore, and we now have an algebraic function, capital T, of x. So, if I want to determine the values of x, remember that's the location where the path of the light intersects with the interface between the two media, if I want to determine the value of x that minimizes capital T, the travel time, I simply take the derivative of this, set it equal to zero, and solve for the x for which that is true. So it's exactly what we do. Here, is, here that is. It's, it's quite a mess because you have to use some chain rules and so forth, but you, you can go through the details and determine that what this ends up giving you is Snell's law. So remember, Snell's law says that the ratio of the indices of refraction equals the ratio of the sines of these angles. You can see here the angles from the vertical. So that's Snell's law. And again, that came from taking the variational form of Fermat's principle, the most natural way to express Fermat's principle, 
applying it to this case where we have homogeneous media, which means that the integrals turn into an algebraic function, take the derivative, set it equal to zero, solve for x, and we end up getting a useful physical principle out of it. Now, if it's the case that we have a non-homogeneous medium, so the index of refraction n is now a function of x and u, so every point x, u in the domain has a different value of the index of refraction. We can't take it out of the integral, so we have to leave it inside the integral. And so we have 1 over c, c is still a constant, times the integral of n ds. So all we can do in this case is re-express ds. Remember, ds is a little infinitesimal element along the path u of x. We prefer to write that in terms of x, because x is our independent variables. So I'd like to write my definite integral in terms of x with respect to x instead of s. So we can express ds as the square root of the sum of the squares of the components dx and du. So dx squared plus du squared gives us ds squared. So ds is just the square root of the sum of those squares. We also have, because u is only a function of x, that it's total differential. du is just du dx times dx. Substitute this total differential in for du. We have a dx squared and a dx squared. I can take those out of the square root. So I have ds is equal to the square root of 1 plus u prime squared. That's this du dx here, all times dx. So the ds then is equal to the square root times dx. So all I've done, and again, you'll see this in a number of examples in future videos, is I've expressed the ds, which goes along the arc length, in terms of dx. It just makes it more convenient to actually evaluate the definite integral. The point, however, is our t, our travel time of light, is now our definite integral, and it involves u of x, which is an unknown function. So we have a definite integral of an unknown function. We want to find the function u of x that minimizes the travel time t. So non-homogeneous media, the travel time require us to evaluate a functional using the calculus of variations. So we can't get rid of that definite integral. We have to keep that definite integral in order to uh, solve for the, the path of the light. So once again, we have the same physical principle. If we apply it to homogeneous media, it ends up being a problem with, in the differential calculus. If it's a non-homogeneous medium, then it's a calculus of variations problem that we need to solve. And that's what I've summarized down here. So extremum in both cases. But here you have an algebraic function, so that's differential calculus. Here you have a functional, which is the definite integral and that requires variational calculus. So these are highly complementary. In fact, you're gonna see how we can go back and forth between differential forms and variational forms uh, when we'd like. So in the next video, we're gonna look at the shape of a liquid drop. So you put a drop of a liquid on a flat, smooth surface. What is the shape of that drop? And we'll take a look at that in the next video.